Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good I evening. You. I see you, Cynthia. How are you today? Wonderful. How are you? Outstanding. Your house is so beautiful. <laughs> I was just looking at the pictures the other day. I, I'm going to ask you to let me use some of them. I'll talk to you about it later. It's really pretty in there. Okay. It really is. So here we are again. We're going to be talking about um, being a royal priesthood today. We're going to be talking about that on today. And I really am excited about that, to be able to share that with everybody. Um, <clears throat> people are actually, are actually operating in this position, but they don't know that they are. And they're, because they're not aware of it, uh, they don't get as much of it done as should be done. So when we get through with this tonight, I think there's going to be such a great revelation in the heart of everybody who, uh, who hears and understands this and who has an ear to hear it and is actually willing to be a priest to be a priest and understand that it's not even possible to do what we do without uh, acknowledging the priesthood. So that is exciting to me. That is exciting to me to share that with you. I, I'm, I'm giving Michelle just a few moments to see if uh, I can transfer this over to her before I get started. And I will check to see if she uh, is having a challenge. And if she is, I will we will just keep going. Hi, Evelyn Coleman, how are you tonight? Okay, let's see. Let me see uh, if I can reach Michelle. And if I can't, we'll be we'll be going on. There she is. Oh, there she is. Okay, I see you. All right, I was just getting ready to bring up my PowerPoint, Michelle. I thought you might have been having some challenges on your end. You know, with the weather and everything, who knows what the internet's doing. It's just floating through the air. Yes, I was having some challenges. I thought you might have been. Okay. Until I had, I had to yeah. move. And to say, post disabled. Okay, it's still saying that you disabled the participation. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hi. Did you turn it? You did turn. I thought you turned it over to me. Okay, I think I got it over to you now, Michelle, so we can get started. There we go. Yeah, we can get started. I'm looking at all that beautiful jewelry up there. <laughs> I see you started moving it. Yeah, I am um, over here in the world. There it is. Okay, so let's Can just start with lace it? number one. This is the first one. Oh, down again. Number one. Okay, and it's not coming up. It, it's not changing. Okay. All right. Well, we'll just okay. talk. About Let me. Okay. While you, do, I'm gonna stop sharing and try to. Okay. I will just talk about it, uh, and uh, you will take it down and and try again. Uh, okay. So we are, we are dealing with lace love apply. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can endure love apply. Can endure. Um, when we get it back up, we, you will see how to contact me if you want to contact me. Um, there will be the email, there will be my website, and there will be the, uh, 
the YouTube channel. So you can, I'm putting all of these on the YouTube channel so you can go back and look at them later and receive them later. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started while she works on that. And so when you get it, so it'll get up and keep going, Michelle. We'll just be started with number 64, the first one. So, <clears throat> a son of God, when do you operate as a priest? Well, we, we looked at all 10 of those um, positions that Jesus gave us. And each one is important. Each one is very important. And uh, because we have not paid that much of attention to them, we don't try to operate in them. But this one is particularly important because it is the reason we can communicate with God. It is the reason we can come into his presence. It is the reason we don't need an, a mediator and we don't need an intercessor. It is the reason, this is the reason because he made us a priest a royal priest, not just a priest, a royal priest. And so we're going to talk about that on tonight. That word, that word in the Greek is uh, um, Ieas, Ieas, Ieas. And it means, uh, a priest means a person that sacrifices or a person that handles sacred rites for God. So we're going to be covering, because I, I could take a whole year teaching this. You know, if I were to just try to teach it for you to understand it in its fullness, but we only have an hour. So what I did was I selected some different things from Strong's Concordance for definitions and from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, from Thayer's Lexicon and from the Vines Dictionary. And so I'm going to use those references to try to get through this in one hour. Hey man, just one hour. <laughs> I usually it usually takes an hour and fifteen minutes because an hour we go an hour, maybe an hour and five minutes, and then we pray. Uh, but this time I'm going to pray twice. I'm going to pray before we start and when we end because we need to really, hi Inez, we really we really need to understand being a priest. We really need to understand that. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to open up our hearts that we might receive on tonight open up our hearts that this information might fall on good ground and we would be able to immediately understand it and comprehend it and get the revelation of it and begin to use and activate it in our life because you have given it to us freely for us to use God. And we want to understand, you say your people perish for lack of knowledge. So we're, we're moving forward in the knowledge of Christ and in the knowledge of what you have left for us to do. And so we thank you that it is good for us all, us all, everyone, even the teacher, Lord. I thank you right now for giving me more from this lesson. And you are the one that's teaching it. So I know that we will all benefit and that we will all be blessed. Okay, so who am I as a royal priesthood? I already talked about what, um, what the strong say about it, the strong concordance, but let's see what uh, Thayer's lexicon says and the International Standard Bible says, it says a, preacher, a priest is authorized by God to minister sacred things, offer offerings and act as a mediator. Okay, so I want you to remember that because that's what you're doing. You are administering sacred things and you're offering up sacrifices and you're acting as a mediator. So as we go forward through this, I wanted you to remember that. And so we're going to have to go back through the Old Testament just a tiny bit to understand this so that we can see where this started. Now, there are four categories that we could talk about. One of them I'm not going to talk about. That's the Gentiles. Those priests are pagan priests. They have pagan gods. They all have their own priests. We find them in the Bible. We're not talking about them tonight. We're only talking about the priests that's in the bloodline or in the understanding that we have that who we are. Now we start with the Jews. So we start with the Jews. And we know from Matthew, we know from Matthew that they exist. So Santi, you're there. Are you there? Are you ready? Oh, you want me to go ahead until you're ready? I'm here, yes, ma'am. Okay, so do you have Matthew 8 and 4, King James Version? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. 
Uh, Matthew 8, 4, King James Version. And Jesus said unto him, See thou, tell no man, but go thy way, shew thyself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Okay, now, one of the things that we have to remember, when Jesus was on the earth, he was in the Old Testament, not the New Testament. So he acknowledged the priest. And he was, at this particular time, he was cleansing a leper. And when he cleansed the leper, he told him to go to the priest and do what he was, he was supposed to do with the priest because the priest was the one that was authorized to do the things of God and to represent God. And for them to be able to do what God wanted them to do, they had to always go back to the priest because they could do nothing for themselves. So in the, in the, in the Old Testament, then we have the high priest and we have the priest and then we have the Levites. Now, this is one thing I want you to remember as we go through this as well. Every priest in the Old Testament must be a Levite, but every Levite could not be a priest. Even though the whole tribe under Aaron, this was the Aaron priesthood. This was the Aaron. If this was a brother of Moses, uh, he had uh, two siblings, Aaron and Miriam. And Aaron was the one that God chose that the priesthood would be under as long as it existed until Jesus arrived. That's where the priesthood would be. So um, if the person did not qualify, even if they were under Aaron, and even if they had, born, had been born in a proper bloodline on the tribe of Levi, then um, they couldn't be priests because you had to come before God perfect. And he had qualifications that he did not change and has not changed since then but the, but the wonderful thing about this so let me let me talk talk to you a little bit about the levites and uh just a little bit so that you can know who they were um levi was a son of jacob and jacob was the son of isaac that stole his brother's blessing uh i didn't think he stole it i think his brother sold it to him and and the blessing came along with the the blessing came along with he tricked his father into giving it to him because they kind of deceived their father. They didn't tell the father what they had done. But anyway, the interesting thing about this is Jacob had two wives. One he loved and one he didn't. And, and his father-in-law deceived him the same way that he deceived his brother. So, you know, that's an indication of, of us understanding seed time and harvest. And as we go through this and understand the importance of this, I think this is going to change your life and change your thinking. And you're not going to be able to uh, uh, just grasp things the way you had previously. It's going to just be so different. So Levi and Judah are the ones that we're talking about tonight. They are the sons of Jacob by the wife he did not love. Isn't that interesting that the wife he did not love had the two sons that, Jesus, that God used for his glory? in this particular bringing Christ into the earth. That's, that's very interesting. Now, the wife he loved did have two sons, uh, Joseph and Benjamin, but they were not the two that we're gonna be talking about tonight. So let's go forward with this. Now, that was number one. And we're gonna talk about three categories here. That was number one, where we had the priests. That was in the Old Testament, in the order of Aaron, who is from the tribe of Levi. Now, number two, Christ, Christ, Christ as priest. Uh, when you go ahead and read that, Shanti's Hebrews 5, 5 and 6 from the King James Version. Yes, Hebrews 5, 5 and 6, King James. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee as he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the older of Melchizedek. Okay, that's the order. I'm sorry, the order. Yeah, it's the order of Aaron and the order of Melchizedek. Okay, Michelle, if you're able to, if you're able to bring that back up, you can bring it back up when you're ready, um, if you're able to. 
And if he doesn't come up, I know you're still having challenges. Okay, um, the second, the, the, um, the third group is us, the royal priesthood. And Jesus made us this. This is one of the positions that he gave us because it was given to him. All right, so as Christians, we are a royal priesthood. So could you read 1 Peter 2, 9 and Revelation 1, 6, Shantese? Yes, 1 Peter 2 and 9. That's King James as well, correct? Yes, both of them. Okay, 1 Peter 2 and 9, King James. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show, should shew forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In Revelation 1, 6. Revelation 1, 6, King James. <clears throat> And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so that that's our position. You see that in the Bible that says that we're priests. We're royal priesthood and we're priests. Every believer is this. Not, not the people that's in the church, not the pastors, uh, not, not church leaders. Every believer is a royal priesthood. And they have to be, they must be, in order to qualify to be in God's presence. This is what's so exciting about this. We have enjoyed the presence of God all this time and didn't know that the reason we can do it is because he's made us a priest and able to handle the things of God. The priests were the only ones that could come into his presence. And so each one of us are now a priest and we can come into his presence. That is exciting. That's exciting for us to know. But the priest also, let me continue talking about the priest because I want to finish on time here. The priest also had high importance. They were next to Moses in influence and dignity. You know, uh, they shared the governmental guidance of the people. Uh, they, had to have, they had to be very virtuous. They had to be high moral people, uh, high moral standards. Um, and their function was to br bring the people in close relationship with God. They brought the people in close relationship with God because the people could not bring themselves in relationship to God at all. They needed the priest to do it. Okay. So through the ministry of the priesthood, Israel was taught they were taught the doctrine of sin and the expiration of it. They were taught forgiveness and worship. And it, it was an indispensable source for their religious knowledge, which channeled through their spiritual life. It, 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 their spiritual life was just, uh, that was it. That was it. So they couldn't do it without the priest. All right, so we're up to number 65 now, Michelle. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to talk about the first priest that was mentioned in the Bible. That was Genesis 14, 18. Can you read that, Shantis, King James Version? Yes, Genesis 14, 18, King James. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the high of the most high God. Okay, and now Chesedek, let's look at who he was. So we see here on the slide that Melchizedek was the first mentioned. The Arianic order of priests was the next one. And the Levitical priesthood was under Aaron as well. We're going to talk about them a little bit but later on, but not a lot because we're going to talk mostly about what the functions are so we would know what we're supposed to do. Because remember, we're talking about the noun, but we also have to, the noun of priest, who we are as priests, but we also have to know what we're supposed to do as those priests that God has made us. So if you would read Hebrews, and Hebrews has a lot of information in here about this priesthood and, and Jesus' position as priest, as high priest. 
And so we're gonna be spending a lot of time in Hebrews getting that information, most of the time in Hebrews. So if you would read Hebrews 7, 1 through 3 in King James, so we can find out about Melchizedek. Yes, Hebrews 7, 1 through 3, King James. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to him to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that, also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descendant, having neither beginnings of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Okay, so look at these qualifications. He was the priest of the Most High God. Um, he was the king of Salem, which was the king of peace. He had no beginning and no end. <clears throat> he was without father and mother. He had no, you know, and and he was made like unto the son of God. So it's just an indication here that he's God. This, this is not a person. This, this is God. And so we know then that this priesthood is God and is of God. And it is the one that we're going to be focusing on, mostly comparing it to the one that God started us off with. Now, let's jump over to Vine's um, Expository Dictionary. And, and, and look at some of the characteristics and differences between the Melchizedek's uh, order and the Arianic order of priesthood. And so that we can see where we are. Now, when we're looking at this, we're gonna to have to look at ourselves in the Melchizedek order, not the Aaron, Aaron order. So as we're going through this, pay attention to that because that's going to be important. So we have, we have um, seven areas where we're going to do this comparison. I believe it's seven of them. And uh, between Melchizedek as priest, and like I said, we don't pay much attention to, to the priesthood because, um, you know, we, we generally think that's the pastor or somebody in the church, elder, somebody else, you know, somebody other than us. But every single one of us, every single one of us is a priest. And so we want to understand that. So let's start with its character. Uh, we're going to start with the with this character, and we're going to compare the character of the Melchizedek, Jesus's, and Aaron's. So let's read Hebrews five, six through ten in the Amplified Bible. That's number one. The character. Hebrews 5, 6 through 10. Mm -hmm. Amplified. Mm -hmm. Just as he also says in another place, you are a priest appointed forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up both specific petitions and urgent supplications for that which he needed with fervent crying and tears to the one who was always able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his fervent submission toward God. His sinlessness and his unfailing determination to do the Father's will. Okay, is that unselfish? Or unfailing? Unfailing. Unfailing. Okay. All right. His sinlessness so, and his uh, unfailing determination to do the Father's will. Okay, you're going to 10. Okay. Is that 10? Oh, no, it's eight. I'm sorry, I'm keep going. Although he was a son who had never been disobedient to the Father, he learned actively, active special obedience through what he suffered. 
and having been made perfect, uniquely equipped and prepared as savior and retaining his integrity amid, um, amid opposition, he became the source of eternal salvation and eternal inheritance to all those who obey him. Being designated by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so one thing we find out about the priest, him being a priest, he was not born obedient. He had to learn obedience by the things he suffered. So here's another reason it's hard for us to learn obedience because we don't want to suffer. But this is what the scripture said he had to do. He had to learn obedience so that he could function as the high priest that we need him to function as. Now, let's take a look at, 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 at Aaron. Aaron had a sin nature. So that wouldn't, that wouldn't work. Uh, Aaron had to die one day. So he couldn't be a priest forever. And the next person had to be very much qualified if he was going to be priest or if he was going to be high priest, especially. Uh, so we would need another one and another one and another one forever unless we were uh, a part of the Melchizedek order. So this was just, uh, Aaron was just a temporary position. And then it talked about um, Jesus being fervor to obey his, his father. Aaron couldn't do that. He, he was, Moses was his spiritual father, but he joined his sister Miriam and they came up against him. They came up against him. So he wouldn't be the one that could do this forever because he had to deal with his sin nature. Okay, the number two is his commission, Jesus's commission. Uh, that's Hebrew 5, 4 and 5, Amplified. Would you read that, Sean? Yes, Hebrews 5, 4 and 5, Amplified. And besides one, and besides, one does not appropriate for himself the honor of being high priest, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So too, Jesus did not glorify himself so as to be made a high priest, but he was exalted and appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son. Today I've begotten, today I have begotten fathered you declared your authority and rule over the nations okay so they both had to be appointed by god jesus didn't make himself high priest god did that he did that but notice he did that as a son so we're talking about our position as a son of god and one of the positions is a royal priesthood and this is jesus's priestly part that we're sharing that we are supposed to be and are, not just supposed and are. Okay, so Aaron was commissioned also by God. So in this part, they're not different. God had choose them, chose them both. He chose the tribe of Levi and he chose Aaron to be the one whose bloodline the priesthood would flow from. Aaron's bloodline, his specific bloodline. Number three, his preparation, Hebrews, 10.5 Amplified, Shantis. And then we're going to do 2.17 through 18. Hebrews 10.5 Amplified. Therefore, when Christ enters into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired. But instead, you have uh, prepared a body for me to offer. Okay, so he needed a body to offer for us to be able to come into his presence. He needed a body to offer. It couldn't be goats. It couldn't be sheep. It couldn't be red heifers, none of that. He needed a human body to offer up for our sacrifice. So... Aaron then, on the other hand, was not going to give physically his body up, but he was selected by God and he had to be consecrated. He had to be consecrated for that to happen. We don't see that happening here in, in, 
Jesus's life did not require that because his life was a life of consecration. It was a life of consecration. But Aaron had to be consecrated and all of the high priests that followed him had to be consecrated. So let's go to the next portion, which is Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 through 18, the Amplified Bible. Hebrews 2, 17, 18. Therefore, it, it was essential that he had to be made like his brothers, mankind, in every respect, so that he might, by experience, become a merciful and faithful high priest in things related to God, to make atonement, pro, um, propitiation, for the people's sins, thereby wiping away the sin, satisfying divine justice and providing a way of reconciliation between God and mankind. Verse 18. Because he himself in his humanity was suffered in being tempted, he is able to help and provide immediate assistance to those who are being tempted and exposed to suffering. Wow. Okay. So divine justice have to be satisfied. Even now we have we are in a position now to help God satisfy divine justice. And we're going to talk about that in a minute because because Jesus has already paid for all of the sins, but then we can participate by how we help God move people and to where he desired they'll be, even if they don't know that they need to be there. That requires a priestly attitude on our part and a priestly duty on our part to mediate for those and help God in those particular situations. So Aaron could only identify with his own experience. He could not identify with every, every temptation, every sin, everything that we could possibly go through, Jesus went through, Aaron couldn't do that. So he was limited, so he could not do that, even if he wanted to do it. Okay, number four, his sacrifice. What was his sacrifice? Um, let's read Hebrews 8 and 3, and then we'll go on and read Hebrews 9, 12 through 15. Are you there, Shanti? You want me to read it? I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> okay. Uh, eight and three amplified. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So that is essential for those. Uh, it is essential for this one also to have something to offer. Okay. Is that, is, is that the end of verse three? Yes. Okay, so go on to four, verse four then. Now, if he were still living on earth, he would not be a priest at all. For there are priests who offer the gifts to God in accordance with the law. Okay, that's the part I wanted to get to. His sacrifice. Now, can you, can you, can you consider this? Jesus could not have been a priest on earth. Why? Because he wasn't from the tribe of Levi. The Levites were the only ones that could be priests under Aaron. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. So he could not have done that on earth. And I know when you read this passage, sometimes maybe that had, if you've ever read that before, it's kind of skimmed over it and wondered why he said that, because he couldn't. He was not from the tribe of Levi. He was from the tribe of Judah. So we want to keep that in mind as we're going through this, that there is nothing that Jesus could have done in the Arianic priesthood. He could only operate in the Melchizedek because he was from the tribe of Judah, and that was the tribe through which Christ would come. Everybody understand that? Is that too deep? Everybody understand that? Okay. Okay. Now, Hebrews 9, 12 through 15, Amplify. Okay. Hebrews 
9, 12 through 15, Amplified. He went once for all into the holy place, the holy of holies of heaven, into the presence of God, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, having obtained and secured eternal redemption, that is the salvation of all who personally believed in him as savior. Okay, or hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. There, there's where we have John 1, 12. When, uh, when it says that, you know, all that received him, he gave them the right, the power to become sons of God. So we're still talking about a son of God that's a priest. And all you have to do is believe on Jesus to be that son and be this priest. Okay, go ahead. Verse 13. For the sprinkling of uh, for the sprinkling, if the sprinkling of ceremonially the defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls, and the ashes of a burnt heifer is sufficient for the cleansing of the body, how much more will the blood of Jesus, who through the eternal Holy Spirit willingly offered Himself unblemished? that is without moral or spiritual imperfection as a sacrifice to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works and lifeless observances to serve the ever living God. For this okay. reason. Wait, oh. Is that 15? No. Go ahead. Um, for this reason, he is the mediator the negotiator of a new covenant that is an eternally new agreement uniting God and man so that those who have been called by God may receive the fulfillment of the promised eternal inheritance since a death has taken place as the payment which redeems them from the sins committed under the um, obsolete first covenant. Okay, so this is the reason we can come into his presence and only priests can do that. Only priests can handle the things of God. So he made us a priest by sacrificing his own body and he cleansed us. So when we think we're not worthy, when we think we, we, we've done something that's too bad, we have misunderstood there's no way that you could do anything so bad that not to come into the presence of God. You are covered by the blood of Jesus. And because of that, you can come into his presence as a priest. There's nothing you could do or ever think that would make any difference to this because you can't accomplish it on your own, nor can I. We can't accomplish this. Now. We are priests because of what he did. So when we're operating in low self-esteem and think we have done a sin that's too bad, that we don't want to run to God when we do wrong, when we do wrong, we should run to God first because we're holy, because we're righteous, because we're priests, not to get to be one. We should go because we already are. We already are. So the things that have held us back and have kept us from doing things and have kept us from thinking that God cared about this and cared about that and he was going to get us for this or get us for that or we were not going to be able to do this or that because of what we had done is total misunderstanding of what this is because of what we had just read Jesus has positioned us as priests he has positioned us as uh, morally and spiritually perfect so that we could go into the presence of God. We cannot go into the presence of God unless that is so. And we will find that true about the priest and the high priest of Aaron. They couldn't do it unless it was so. And the same thing now is true for us. We couldn't do it without Jesus have done uh, doing this for us. So Aaron could only use the blood of animals and that could only be done once a year to mediate for the people. And then, you know, uh, <clears throat> and he had to have certain qualifications to be able to do that. So still, it was a temporary fix. It was a temporary fix. And number five, um, his sanctuary, Jesus' sanctuary. So this particular one, Shanti, 
uh, I have amplified. This is Hebrews 9, 11 through 17. If you would just read um, 11 through 12 in King James, and then go down to 15 and read 15 through 17. 11 and 12 King James? Yes. Okay. But Christ being uh, come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And go down to 15 and 15 through 17. King James Version? Yes. 15 through 17. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where the testament is, there must also of uh, there must also of necessity be the death of the test as of the testator. Okay. For the, go ahead. I for you a were testament. Yes. Yeah. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the test while the testator liveth. Wow. Oh, okay, so that meant if we if we were even able to, we'd have to physically die. And if we physically die, what could we do in life? All of those animals that blood, all of their blood was taken to the altar. They had to die completely. As priests, those animals had to die completely so that their blood could be taken to into the Holy of Holies. So we would have to physically die and give up our blood, even if we were able to. Now we're not able to do that. I mean, if we did that, then we wouldn't be here to do anything. So we couldn't do it. And it's very important that we understand all of the nuances and why we couldn't do it. There must be a death and the blood must be used to atone for the sin because there is a divine justice that must be satisfied. And so you folk that I'll get all wrapped up in things being just and in the order, uh, you're divinely correct. <laughs> you just have to get some control to it. You know, you just have to get some control to it. That's all. I, I mean, the, the, you see here, this is important. We would have to have physically died and give up our blood, every one of us. And none of us could do that. There wouldn't be any left. So we had to really understand. So we're priests because he was willing to give up his body and his blood because that's what it took. It took him dying. It took his body. So we see that the sanctuary, it was in heaven. It wasn't the temple. It wasn't the tabernacle. It wasn't the tent that David had the, that, that David had the uh, ark in. It's in heaven. It's in heaven. That's where his sanctuary, in the presence of God, that's where his, that's where his sanctuary is. You know, and so he died that we might have this inheritance because someone had to die to, to, to correct what Adam did so that we could handle holy things of God like Adam did before he sinned. We could handle the holy things of God. Someone had to die and it was him physically died. It was him that had to do it so he could be the mediator now. He sits on the right hand of the father interceding for us still. He's the mediator. He mediated for us to get into God's presence and he's still doing it. You know, he brought us into the presence of God and the payment was his own death. You know, so we can see from Aaron's uh, order of priesthood, um, he had to do it in a physical building uh, and they were torn down uh, at least the temple a few times, not the tabernacle, but the temple a few times. And, you know, 
He had to be sin free to qualify. He wasn't. And he had to offer up his own life and he couldn't. So we're talking about the sanctuary. So God wanted an eternal sanctuary in heaven for us. And that's what we have. Number six, his ministry. Hebrews 2, 16 through 18, the Message Bible. Shantise. Hebrews 2, 16 through 18, Message Bible. It's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. It was for people like us, children of Abraham. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then when he came before God as high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help where help was needed. My God. So he had to be one among us. Remember in the Old Testament when God said, I look for one among them so I could, I could save them, but I found none? He had to be one among us. And this scripture here, we can't get to all of it. You know, I got a lot of scriptures tonight and I can't talk about them as I usually do. But it's talking about, this scripture is talking about God didn't send Jesus to fallen angels. He sent them to fallen men. So that's why angels are mentioned. He didn't send them to, the, uh, to correct the angels for what they did, but he sent Jesus to correct our situation so we could come into his presence again. So uh, Aaron was a mediator, but it was temporary. And the standards for him was very high. And if he didn't meet the standards of any priest didn't meet the standards, they couldn't do it. Jesus had to meet them as well so that he could do it. God did not change his standards because we have issues. God does not change his word because we have issues. God does not change his order because we have issues. He expects us to obey his word and then all of our issues will be taken care of. Okay, its effects. What effect did it have by Jesus becoming our high priest is, is mentioned in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, the Message Bible, and Hebrews 4, 16, um, King James. So let's do 2, 4, 14 and 15, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, Shantese. Hebrews 2, 14, 15, Message Bible. Since the children are made of flesh and blood, it's logical that the Savior took on flesh and blood in order to rescue them by his death. By embracing death, taking it into himself, he destroyed the devil's hold on death and freed all who cower through, who cower through life, scared to death of death. Jesus. Wow. So blood and blood, flesh and blood, our communion, his flesh, his blood. Doesn't that have a different meaning now? Did you understand that? I mean, we always knew it was important, but his flesh and blood was what it took to get the divine justice satisfied that the price we had to pay, which we would have to have. We would have had to pay individually with our own life. We would have had to pay that with our own life. That is communion. Wow, so we're able to handle communion. We're able to handle communion because we're priests. We can even do communion at home. We can do all the priestly duties because we are priests. Okay, uh, Hebrews 4.16, King James. Hebrews 4.16, King James. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, so we should never, ever, no matter how bad we think we've done something or not, not, not want to go boldly to God about it, whatever it is. Whatever it is, we should go boldly to God. I messed up. I know I'm wrong, but I'm just coming to you. God, I don't know what to do about this situation. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything I know to do. I'm following every, every word I know. I'm, I'm using my faith. I'm coming to you. Whatever, whatever it is, we have to come to him. We have to come to him. And so it's very important that we understand that. 
And so that was that was number seven, the effects of, of him being our high priest. And so let's go on to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia and look at the nature of the Aaron, the priest's office. We're looking, we're looking at Aaron's office now, and we're looking at what that implies. Um, and like I said, I'm using these uh, resources so that I can narrow it down and I, I won't have to spend more time than I have allotted to share this with you. So we're going to look at um, we're going to look at four different things here. And um, and then we're going to go and talk about our qualifications. Um, so the first one is that it implies divine choice and divine appointed. So it was God's choice and God's appointed. He he chose the Aaron's order and he chose the Melchizedek order, and Jesus chose us to be a part of that order. Number two, it implies representation. God needed someone to bring his people close to him. You know, the function of the priest uh, <clears throat> appears uh, is, is for them to come into a divine presence of God, representing them, representing the people, and to act for them in the things uh, pertaining to God. And those things were act for the people, for they couldn't do it for themselves. It was to make uh, perpetuations for their sins all of their sins for all of the people, they couldn't do it themselves. And when the high priest sinned, guess what folks? If the high priest sinned, everybody had sinned. Isn't that interesting? If the high priest sinned, everybody had sinned. Why? Because his official action was recorded as their action. Hmm. So, when he went into that Holy of Holies to atone for them, that's, that's how that worked. So if he sinned, and, and, and the conditions for him to be high priest, was, the qualifications are very high, are very high. We're going to go over those. Not, not in, I'm going to mention them. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm going to tell you what they are because I don't have enough time to talk about them. But if he sinned, everybody had sinned. Ah. So that, let, let, let us think about this in our priesthood now, us being, us being royal priesthood. Let's, let's think about this as we go through this process. Okay, so he had to act for the people because they, they couldn't act for themselves. Number three, it implies offerings and sacrifices. The chief duty of the priests was to reconcile man to God by making atonement for their sins. And that was all kinds of different offerings and sacrifices that they had made but the one that we're going to just talk about tonight is, is the one that the high priest made. And there was plenty of other offerings in Leviticus. We can't go through that, you know, but, but they're there. Uh, the high priest carried blood to the most holy place. And, you know, it was from a lamb, an unblemished lamb. And there was qualifications for the lamb, too. And he sprinkled that blood seven times before the mercy seat. And, he, and that's symbolizing the covering of the sins of the people in the eyes of God. So God's presence was in the Holy of Holies when he went in there with that blood. Well, he went in there with that blood and sprinkled it seven times. Oh, the mercy seat. It covered the sins of the people for a year. Okay. So number four, it implied intercession. Aaron and his sons were also intercessors. They were intercessors. They interceded for the people. And so remember I said um, that um, the, the character was very important for the priests. And the priests all came from the tribe of Levi, from the order of Aaron. They were coming down through Aaron's bloodline. But the qualifications are very high. I'm just going to read them, not discuss them. If you have some questions about it, jot it down and you can ask me about any one of these at the end. First, they had to be consecrated. Remember, I said Jesus uh, lived a consecrated life. He, he was just living a consecrated life. They must be consecrated. Uh, they must wear their vestments. All of the vestments meant something. The, the uh, ephod, all of, those, all of those vestments meant something. They must wear them when they were ministering. Um, and um, they had to be ceremoniously pure. 
you know, they had to be holy. They must be physically perfect. They could not have any physical defect, no physical defect. The high priest could not marry a widow, a divorced woman, a polluted woman, or a harlot. Only a virgin with a pure bloodline. That, that woman's bloodline must be pure and she must be a virgin. Now, they can't cheat on this because God knows. This is the requirement that God has for him to be able to qualify to represent the people like that. A whole nation of people he's re represented. He could not come into contact with death. He could not rent his clothes. He could not defile himself. While his sons may be able to divide, defile themselves for a family member, he couldn't do it. Uh, and so once a high priest, he was high priest for life. He was, it was a life position. So what does defiling mean? That, that meant coming in contact with dead people or dead things. You know, in the Old Testament, it had eye for eye and tooth for tooth. And, and, you know, some people had sexual problems. You know, they, they did sex incorrect. Uh, whatever they were doing, the high priest could do none of it in order to qualify to atone for the sins of the people the way he had to do. Now, they had other duties. You know, they, they had meal offerings and they, uh, they had to make sure that the lambs kept burning. Uh, they had to change the showbread regularly. They had to assist in the arrangement of that. They had to burn incense. All of that's in Leviticus and Exodus. And, and uh, so we don't have to, I, don't, I can't go through that, it's too much. Okay, put up the next slide, um, Michelle. Let's look at your qualifications and my qualifications. Um, all we have to do is be born again. You know, to be born again and to believe Christ, to receive him as our Lord and Savior means that he gives us the authority and the right to become a son of God. And once we become a son of God, one of the things that has to happen to us is we have to be a priest because we can't go into God's presence if we're not a priest. We can't handle God's things if we're not a priest. We can't do that without that happening. So your character, your, your, your uh, character uh, in mind, we have to do what God did. We have to do it the way Jesus did. He was at our example. So let's look at Ephesians 5, 5, um, 2, King James Version. Shantese. Ephesians 5, 2, King James. And walk in love as Christ also have loved us and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Okay, so when it says present your body as a living sacrifice, whenever we do that, that's a sweet smelling savor unto God, okay? Whenever we do that, and we're gonna talk about what we need to, how that happens. Okay, so there are things that we give to people that are sacrifices. So right now, we're talking about the things that we sacrifice and the things that we don't even realize that we're sacrificing. But whenever we sacrifice something, we are operating in our office as a priest whenever we sacrifice something. So let's look at Philippians 4, 18 through 20, Shantis, in the Message Bible. Philippians 4, 18 through 20, Message Bible. And now I have it all and keep getting more. The gifts you sent with the um, Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, yes. Epaphroditus were more than enough, like a sweet smelling sacrifice roasting on the altar, filling the air with fragrance, pleasing God to no end. You can be sure that God will take care of everything you need. His <clears throat> generosity exceeding even yours in the glory that pours from Jesus. Our God and Father abounds in glory that just pours out into eternity, yes. Okay, so Paul is saying here, your, sac your, your gift was a sacrifice. So when you are giving gifts like this, that is a sacrifice. And it's a sweet smelling savor unto God. So he's talking about Epaphroditus and his gift being a sacrifice. So we're talking about sacrificial things, things that we sacrifice. 
Okay, let's look at Hebrews 11.4 and King James Version. The things that we offer to God. Hebrews 11.4, King James. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead yet speaketh. Okay. Wow. So your first, when you give your first to God, if you make your sacrifice, you give your first of your day, you give your first fruit of your offering. If you do first fruit offering, if you're doing any, when you're giving your first of God, you're making a sacrifice, you're making a sacrifice. God says Abel's gift was even speaking after he was dead, his gift was still speaking because it was a sacrifice and a sweet savor unto him. Okay, Hebrews 13, 15, King James Version. Is it 15 or 16? Uh, 15. I have 15. Is it 15? Read 15 and 16. Let's see which one it is. Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. Okay. Hebrews 13, 15, 16, King James Version. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Okay. Sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice of worship. That's a priestly duty. That is a priestly position. When we do that, we're doing that as a priest. We're doing that as a priest. So that was one of the, the things we talked about, giving gifts, that was number one under sacrifices. The things that we offer to God was number two, which we just finished. And number three, how about yourself? How about yourself being the sacrifice? Read Romans 12, one, Shanti's and King James Version. Romans 12, no, one. No, no. Romans 12, 1 in King James, and then Romans 12, 1 and 2 in the Message Bible. Okay. Romans 12, 1, King James. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12, 1 and 2, King uh, uh, Message Bible. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Okay, so we seek to be a priest. We have to be mature as well. So we're growing this year, right? We're growing this year, so we're going to be a uh, a, a more mature priest by the end of the year. <laughs> We're growing this year. So it's important. It's important that we sacrifice all of our life. You know, I, I try to teach that as often as I can. Don't think that just because you got a job that it was you that got it. Anything we do in life, God is a part of it. And he probably sent us there in the first place. And so if we know that he sent us there and we're working as unto him, which we should be doing for everything that we do as unto him, we'll get the information we need to be a priest in that place. Wherever we are, we can operate as a priest of God in that place, handling the things of God. So as a priest, a royal priest, a son of God who operates in this position of a royal priesthood, there are four things, there's a minimum, a minimum. There's probably a lot more, I can't cover that in an hour, but there's a minimum of four things that we need to consider 
And one of them is that we're authorized to handle the things of God. You know, God is in you. He's Emmanuel. You are the temple of God. You are authorized. I'm authorized to handle the things of God. I'm authorized to heal the sick. I'm authorized to cast out demons. I'm authorized to raise the dead. I'm authorized to intercede for somebody. I'm authorized to be the mediator for somebody. So that, that number two is the authorization to do all of the, the, the things that God has authorized us to do. And when we do it, we do it as priests. We do it as priests. So as a mediator, number two is a mediator. We're the go-between God and man on behalf of our brother in Christ, our brother in Christ, we are our brother's keeper. When we see the devil beating up on him and he don't know that he's beating him on it, male or female, it doesn't matter because brother is not gender, then we can go to God on their behalf and we can do what we're supposed to do, especially going back to the 14 love habits that say, I love you and, and, and understand that anytime we're doing any of that, you know, we're in a position of priesthood. We intercede for our family. We intercede for the body of Christ. We intercede for businesses. We intercede for God's creation, animals, anything that we want to intercede for, we can as his priest. We're authorized to do it. We don't realize we're authorized to do it. You can speak, you can speak on behalf of the squirrels in your yard if you want to say something. Because we're authorized to do it. That's number two. Number one, we're authorized to to handle the things of God. Number two, that we're mediators. We are talking about being a priest here. Number three, we're authorized. We sacrifice. We sacrifice praise. We sacrifice love. It's not possible to love people without a sacrifice because it's an unselfish act. The total 14 of those are unselfish acts. There's nothing that you can do to promote yourself and operate in pride and still love people. That is a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. Your body is a sacrifice. We just got through talking about that. But before we close, we're going to read about that in a little bit. Because uh, that's going to be our last scripture. Your, your forgiveness, forgiving people who are unlovable and unforgivable, to forgive them, to love them, to pray for them, and to do something good for them, that is a sacrifice. You operate as a priest when you do that. To be a person of peace. Remember the, 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 the Melchizedek was king of Salem, which means they was king of peace. And Jesus is the prince of peace. When you understand that you are supposed to make peace whenever possible, which means you sometimes will have to tell people you are sorry for things and apologize for things that you know that they did and that you did not do. As a priest, you're supposed to be able to do that. I'm supposed to be able to go to somebody and say, please forgive me. And knowing that they're wrong and knowing that I didn't do it, that is a priestly position. That's operating as a royal priesthood. And then by faith, using your faith. Man, it's a, man, it's a sacrifice sometimes to use your faith. But you might, you'd much rather believe the banker. You'd much rather believe uh, a business person. Yeah, you know, you'd much rather believe something that you can see and touch. Because faith requires you to believe that you have it before it materializes because everything in the spirit is more real than in the natural. So the things in the natural, they're there so that we can see what spiritually it looks like since we can't see in the spirit, but we can see in the natural and we can identify things in the natural. And so we are a sacrifice. A priest is a sacrificial person. And when you do these things, you're operating in the office of a royal priesthood under the order of Melchizedek which Christ is the high priest, like Aaron was the high priest, and the rest of them were priests under him, okay? So now the fourth one is that your temple. What does Jesus say his temple was? What was his temple? It was in heaven, and that's where we're seated, in heaven, in heavenly places. This is not our home. We are seated next to him in heavenly places. So our body is the temple of God, and therefore, we cannot disregard our royal priesthood by not understanding the function of our body. Now, I'm going to say something here that people don't talk about in church, and that's sex. And I did put on this, this is not for children. So if somebody let the children read it, it's on them. We just look at sex as something, you know, that we do to produce children. Most people, I think, enjoy the pleasure of it, and they look at the pleasure of it because God made it pleasurable. But sex represents something in the spirit first. 
don't, don't you understand when God makes us pregnant with things? What do you think? Did? It was our intimate time with him. That was a sexual encounter, intimate with God. That's what that was. That was a sexual encounter when we're intimate with him and he impregnates us with a business. He impregnates us with a ministry. He impregnates us with great ideas. He impregnates us with things. That's sex. And that's spiritual sex. And that is the real part of it. And the purpose of it, we have abused and misused because we don't want to follow the directions for the proper use of it between spouses, a heterosexual husband and wife. We, we, you know, we come up with the things that sound good to us. So I said all that to say, when we read the next one, I want you to understand that we're talking about the temple of God that he lives in you is your body and your body even though it's physical it belongs to him as well when he says that a husband's body belongs to his wife and the wife's body belongs to his husband he's talking about his bride as well jesus as the husband of the body of christ our bodies our physical bodies belong to him and our spiritual a part of that belongs to him as well and he belongs to us. He belonged to us and we belong to him. So when we read this next part, we're talking about our temple. We're talking about our physical body and how we should handle it. And uh, so please pay attention to that as we go through this. First Corinthians 6, 16 through 20, the Message Bible. First Corinthians 6, 16 through 20, Message Bible. There's more to sex than mere skin to skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as uh, physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. Since we want to become spiritually one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. There is a sense in which sexual sins are different from all others. In sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies. These bodies that were made for God, give, for a God given and God modeled love for becoming one with another. Or didn't you realize that your body is a sacred, a, a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit. Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. God owns the whole works. So let people see God in and through your body. Wow. Isn't that interesting where we were talking about the temple of God and we were talking about that a lot of times when we're looking at this scripture and, and, and we we're talking about uh, our bodies are not our own. I don't think we paid much attention to it, but, but if we did, fine. If we didn't, it was because we didn't understand the priesthood. We didn't understand the priestly part. God is in us, which means our body is the temple that he dwells in. And we take it anywhere. We do anything in it. We say anything in it. We don't pay attention because we don't understand that we are a royal priesthood. So we have to be careful about our behaviors and our attitude. People have to see God when they see us. When we show up in our physical body, they're supposed to see God. They're supposed to see him. We can't go in there with all kinds of attitudes and behaviors and, 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 and just ignore the fact that we have brought the living God in the presence of people and dishonored and disgraced him because we did not understand and know who we are and what we represent and that we are a priest before God, representing him before people. As a royal priest, we are authorized to handle God's things. We must be living a holy life. You know, we're being a mediator. We're making sacrifices. We're being a sacrifice. And we're honoring the temple, uh, which is our body, that God dwells in. And that's pretty much 
what I wanted to cover on tonight. If anybody has any questions or any comments, uh, can anybody share anything that they learned on tonight that will help them be a royal priesthood or at least step in and can anybody share anything tonight? Nobody? Did anybody learn anything they can share tonight? Well, I'll say this, um, I'll just see, um, I'll share uh, the book of Hebrews where you were explaining where the book, well, the word was talking about Christ and how he did not gl glorify himself and all that he went through in his physical side as the son of man. He went through everything, um, experienced everything that we even today are experiencing so that he would be merciful. He, he decided to do that and, and never turned back from it and then paid the price for it all. That right there is something that's sticking with me in my walk um, of death to become conformed into the image of Christ. So that's the area that really gripped me on tonight as a royal priesthood. Okay, anybody else? Anybody else? Well, I learned as a priest you know, that I can witness for Christ and I can follow his, his laws and his precepts, and I can do the things that he wants me to do in him. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful, because you're a priest. And mm -hmm. these things that we do, that we just take for granted, they are priestly things. The things that I have shared tonight are priestly things. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that God, that Jesus wanted us to understand about being a royal priesthood. Anybody else? Anybody else? Did everybody? When you were talking about the high priest um, sinning and everybody else was um, would be sinning as well, I thought about myself as walking in the in the um, order of a high priest. I have to watch how I do things, how I behave myself, how I walk as a priest so that my light can shine for Christ so that way I will not sin. That's good. That's good. And I, I'm happy to hear all of that because that's important. The last thing that I wanted to point out was before we close on tonight, our families are watching us. We're praying for our families to be saved, those that are not saved. We're praying for them to get out of habitual sins and generational stuff. Can they see God when they see us? Can, you know, because our testimony should speak for itself. It should not that we should, we shouldn't have to say anything. Our life should be, I was, I was talking to somebody a couple of nights ago that was um, trying to tell me that God wanted us to be poor. No, what kind of representation of that, of a God whose streets are paved with gold in heaven, the gold is so bright, it, it, it shines like the sun. Why would he want us to be poor representing him? What kind of representation would that be? I mean, we don't have to be, uh, uh, millionaires and billionaires if we don't desire to do that but we certainly not representing god well if we think that we're supposed to represent him as a pauper no no as a priest though we have to live a life before people where they can see that it's god now we're not going to be uh, uh 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 religious about this and just say everything we're going to cross every uh t and dot every I. No, we're not going to do that. You know, as hard as we try, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. But we can walk in all the light we know. And when we're walking in whatever light we know, somebody's going to see that light. Especially if we had been walking in the darkness before and all of a sudden we got a revelation and we're walking in the light. Yeah, they're going to notice. They're going to notice. And that's all it takes to get God glory. 
That's all it takes for somebody to see God and want to know him better because we have presented ourselves as a royal priesthood before them. Okay, well, I pray that we enjoyed this on tonight. I do pray that we enjoyed it on tonight. Did we have fun tonight, folks? <laughs> or was I the only one having fun? <laughs> okay, what's, ne what's next, uh, Michelle? What's the next one? Chosen generation. Uh, I might do one or two of these. Um, I, I don't know if I can squeeze two in, but I might try. But we're going to stick with chosen generation right now. That's what we're going to talk about next week. And if I can squeeze in another one, I will. If not, we'll stick with just this one. Uh, that's what we're going to do next week. And so we can take that down now, Michelle, and we'll pray. And we're done for tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this great body of believers. I thank you for everyone that we have heard, God. And we prayed in the beginning. We know that when we ask you, you answer at the point of prayer. And so I thank you right now for each and every one that we have received this on good ground. And we, from this point on, will represent you as priests. We understand that the holy things of God are holy. And we are able to handle them because you have prepared us. You have made us righteous. You have made it possible for us to come in your presence without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, without anything wrong at all, God. Your blood, Jesus, has covered us. And so we can come boldly before the throne of God and represent you and speak well of you and live well of you. And we just thank you for it right now, Father. We thank you, God, for I'm ministering to everyone on here on tonight, God, and those that will watch it later on social media, on uh, YouTube, on Twitter, wherever they watch it, God, we thank you right now that you will bless whatever they put their hands to in their families, God, and that you will move them to your expected end and he help each and every one of us grow, God, so that we can receive the double because we know that the double is more than the money. We know that it's anointing. We know that it's ability. We know that it's divine work that we want to do. And you are moving us to that position over the next year and over the next decade. And we receive it and it is done and it is so. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, well, that's it for the night. Hi, Marlene. Good to see you all right. tonight. You too. Good night. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, Inez, Evelyn, Michelle, Good night, Good night, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>